Welcome everyone. So today we'll see some general concepts about computing. Let me share my screen. Um, So let me just make it a bit size. I don't know why I can't hide the sidebar. Supposedly it's hidden, but I can still see it. Well, anyway. I think there is some more there. So <laughs> we'll see a bit about computability and stationarity, a bit of history. So last week we saw that uh, complexity um, occurs when you have interactions between components, and one of its implications is that it limits predictability uh, <clears throat> precisely because of the new information that is generated by, by these interactions. And we saw that this leads, um, well, in, in order to, to face complexity, one of the central concepts related to it is adaptation. Because if we are limited in our predictability um, when dealing with complexity, then we should build systems that can adapt to unforeseen changes. So whatever information is generated in these uh, interactions, uh, the system will be able to withstand. And one way of dealing with this is self-organization. We saw, we saw a few examples and we'll go into more detail in the, in the next classes. How can we build adaptive systems? How, uh, how can we exploit self-organization to achieve this adaptation in a robust way? But today we'll go a bit deeper into the theoretical and practical aspects of computability or what, what is computation. Um, so in, in the history of our species, we can identify three revolutions. Uh, first one has had to do with agriculture and we could say that it mainly dealt with the control of matter. Second was the industrial revolution and that dealt mainly with the control of energy. And the third one that we're still going through uh, would be the revolution of information. And of course it deals with the control of information. And each of these revolutions had a very deep um, effects and precedental impact on our societies and our culture, on our technology. Uh, on our cities, um, our psychology, um, on our politics. And of course, the information revolution is no exception. And we are living each day with, with these transformations. Um, so it, it makes sense to, to try to understand a bit better how, how this information revolution took place. But for, first of all, uh, computation, what, what is it? Um, and there are many different uh, notions. The most general would be simply it's transformation of information. So this would be very, very general. But uh, I mean, anyone uh, knows what was the first computer? You can just unmute yourselves or, or write on the chat. It was not the iPhone, that's for sure. Well, you, you're not so young. <laughs> uh, Bruno writes Abacus. Eva writes ENIAC. Well, that was one of the first digital computers, the ENIAC. There's a whole debate because there were many different parallel 
developments in the 40s and 50s. Um, and it's also depending on how you define a computer, because for example, uh, Odin writes Turing, Turing's computer to crack the Enigma, that was a um, special purpose computer. And when we speak about the computer or the first digital computer or sorry, uh, electronic computer, uh, people usually refer to uh, general purpose computers. So basically something that could perform well, not anything because all computers are limited, but let's say not just one thing. And uh, the um, uh, Colossus, was it Colossus? The, no, no it, so that was a letter machine. Well, the machines that computer and his team used to, to crack the Enigma code, they were just built for that. And uh, in, a, in a similar way, um, whenever Bush, for example, he built an analytic engine and that was only for solving differential equations. And that was also analog. So, uh, but yeah, that, that was not digital computer. Um, Bruno also writes that there, there was an analog computer in 100 BC. Uh, yes, Charles Babbage machine. So the, there are like different stages of complexification. So the Babbage machines, uh, theoretically, it could, could have been a general purpose computer, but it was never finished. So uh, then it's like he had the idea in theory, but he didn't manage to build it. But actually, in recent years, some people kind of finally build it, and indeed it works, uh, and it's mechanical. You know, so it's not electronic. And um, and before that, there were some calculating machines like uh, Pascal and uh, Leibniz built some uh, machines, mechanical machines that would do arithmetic arithmetic operations uh, uh, using technology similar to to clockwork. Um, but yeah, the abacus are thousands of years old. But even before, we could say that our fingers are computers because basically there are tools that help us compute, transform information. Um, Ellie writes, Mayans use calendar gear like to compute dates. Um, yeah, and, and also pre-Hispanic cultures had two calendars, the solar and lunar, and then they kind of uh, have different phases and every 52 years they, they coincide again. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> depending on our criteria of what a computer, we could go from the fingers to the abacus to uh, one of the first electronic uh, computers. General purpose. And well, w what can we do with computing? Well, we can do many things, of course, uh, like having this class online. Um, and it is general purpose. Of course, they have their limits as well. Um, but we can see what effects computers have had in, in our society just in recent years. Um, I mean, there, there are lots of uh, things that have been said about this, how, uh, well, just last week we mentioned how computers allow us to study complexity. And it was just in the 1980s that uh, personal computers became available that it, it was possible to, to have the widespread study of, of complex systems. Um, then the internet has also had a huge impact on how we share information on the, how knowledge is distributed, how we can acquire knowledge. The internet 2.0, where it became relatively easy to produce content also had a huge impact because uh, before we had information distribution that was from one source and then broadcasted to, to many uh, listeners, be it newspapers or prints, uh, radio, TV, cinema. Basically, there were few people who were producing information, and then many people who who were uh, consuming it. And only in this century, we became well. The the possibility to to produce information was um, widespread, uh, so it became relatively easy to let's say have your own uh, podcast, to upload your own videos to YouTube. 
so so that has had a, a huge influence and then of course this led to to social networks as we know them today like facebook and twitter and so on uh where let's say people share many things not necessarily useful uh and it's it's a whole ecology in there um and a, a few years ago um some some people made an experiment and, and they noticed that people of a certain age who were not using computers so often when they were uh, asked for the question the brain region or their brain region associated with memory would become active so they would try to remember things but then uh let's call digital natives um when they were asked the question instead of going into memory the uh brain region i can't remember which brain region but basically their strategy would be oh let's google it and then a whole uh, let's say <laughs> the fact that we don't have to memorize things anymore uh has changed our brains already in the sense that many people uh, will not remember things and, and will depend on technology for for survival um so yeah and let's say it's difficult to predict what other effects we will have in the in the near future uh, given the new new advances so there are several implications that the development of uh information and communication systems have had so th there are many so-called more like laws uh well the uh, more uh, gordon moore was one of the founders of intel but even before he he was one of the people who developed the transistor um and um so, so he noticed that every year and a half or i uh, I forget if originally it was year and a half or two years, but let's say more uh, recently it was every year and a half. The the number of transistors in a chip would double. Uh, so he predicted that if that trend would continue, then we will have computers of certain capacity. And um, uh, until about ten years ago, that law held. So it was more more than half a century. Uh, and we had exponential increase in number of transistors, and not only that, in storage capacity, in processing power, in bandwidth, and in, in some cases, uh, also the, the costs were reduced exponentially. Um, and in many cases, it was super exponentially, so it was faster than exponential. Uh, so, so many people started extrapolating that in a wrong way, because if you extrapolate an exponential curve, say you never reach uh, so-called singularity, uh, you you need a hyperbolic curve for that. Let's say that at some point it will go to infinite. I mean, an exponential curve just keeps growing, but the limit when you reach infinite, it's infinite because, yeah. Um, so, uh, well, the, this idea of singularity is wrong from the start, but uh, let's just stick to, to the exponential increase. It's basically saturated because there are limits. Uh, I mean, uh, our universe has limits at different scales. So many people were warning, oh, maybe we will not be, manage to, to make processors faster than, I don't know, three megahertz because uh, the chips will basically melt. And then there were um, steel tricks that people invented to, to go around some of these limits. Or like, OK, we cannot increase the clock speed anymore, but then we can do some other things. But uh, let's say the, the number of the, the size of the transistors uh, seems to be reaching already a minimum bound. Like, I, I, I forget, it's already 5 nanometers or 11 nanometers. Well, but for sure, it's difficult to go under the atomic level. So let's say uh, even if you have, for example, memories that are like one atom is encodes one bit of information, 
uh, there's no foreseeable way in which you could go even lower. But even before reaching that limit, the these exponential increases are, are slowing down, especially for for clock speeds. They they already uh, stabilized. So it seems that a posteriori it was not like an exponential, but just like a sigmoid. And let's say it was a, it had a phase of exponential increase, but then it's leveling uh, to to some limit. Um, so of course that limits computing power. Um, it, it also had implications in cognitive science because uh, basically cognition. Uh, independently of how we define it, deals with information processing. So before computers, uh, I mean, there was psychology, but uh, let's say, well, neuroscience uh, was developed e even after computer science, but I mean, it was very, very basic. Um, just trying to understand uh, the, 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 the working of neurons, but, Let's say using computers, we have been able to understand better how cognition works in, in humans and in other animals, and in general by building artificial systems that try to, to exhibit cognition. And this, of course, is known as artificial intelligence, uh, that it has a practical side, like, okay, let's build systems that can do things, let's say process information uh, to, to solve problems, uh, but also. In, in some ways, some of these systems can help us understand our own intelligence. Um, and also the availability of, of data has exploded exponentially uh, for, for already quite a while. I, I don't know the, the recent numbers, but uh, the speed was something like every two years, yeah, it would duplicate. So for example, the amount of information that our species would produce uh, 2021 and 2022 would be similar to that information produced uh, from the origins of writing to 2020. Uh, and, and this had been duplicating every two years. So of course we can ask how much of that information is actually useful, uh, how much of that information is redundant, and of course not much, but that a huge amount of data allows us to, to do many things that we weren't able to do beforehand. For example, computational social science that uh, later we, we will go a bit deeper into that. So um, social sciences were, well, they are still kind of uh, looked upon and down uh, by the so-called hard sciences uh, because uh, it's more difficult. Well, of course they, they deal with more complex systems so it's difficult to, to contrast different theories because you have, it's very difficult to make experiments and to have reproducibility. Um, however, with the huge amount of data that we are getting and with computational methods and agent-based models and other techniques, uh, we are able to start contrasting social theories. So we could say that computer science is helping social sciences uh, become harder um, in the sense that now you can go beyond just rhetorics to, to defend or discredit a theory. Uh, you, you can just real data uh, and before you put on that. And we already mentioned that there are telescopes for complexity and also the, there's uh, an, an interesting uh, uh, theory. Well, if, if, you, if you know <laughs> the novels of Brave New World by um, um, Aldous Huxley and 1994 by George Orwell. They were both written more or less uh, around the same time, let's say uh, a bit after the Second World War, and they were both futuristic. Uh, however, they were uh, rather different in their perspectives. Uh, so 1994 was extrapolating more like the uh, absolutist power uh, represented by Hitler or Stalin. And of course we have North Korea and I mean, some people will say China, it's a bit like that in the sense that the states control everything, but let's say, of course it has its limits. Uh, and some people say that we are 
let's say our present is more like brave new world thanks to to the technology uh developer around information uh theory um and telecommunications because this technology prevented um it, it prevented the control of information uh by big brother let's say and of course there's always a threat that this information will let's say that some information will be hidden or controlled uh, not necessarily by the state it would be by whoever uh, but let's say society is making efforts not to not to reach such scenarios um and yeah north korea we could say that one case where this didn't happen but of course they don't have internet there um yeah i, I mean we could argue more about that um and if you want to know more about history i can recommend uh this book by walter isaacson uh, the innovator so so he tells the story of about many people who were involved in the information revolution from ada lovelace um vannevar bush alan turing Klaus shannon bill gates steve jobs and many others so i, I mean it has many many interesting anecdotes and stories uh, and it's interesting how many uh, of these are related and entwined uh, uh, so for example one of the things i learned in this book is that uh, the personal radios were the first killer app of transistors uh, so when they were developed in the 1950s let's say like okay we can uh we, we don't need vacuum tubes anymore for computers but where do we sell them because let's say there was no market for computers there was market for radios uh many people already had radios it was a whole industry um so um the, there are some historians that argued that it was because of the personal radios uh that the the generational gap between let's say people who lived uh second world war and those who were born afterwards uh, basically the the people in the late 50s and 60s and even 70s uh let's say the whole movement um that had many implications uh in part was possible because of this technology in the sense that if you had the old radios where it was like a huge furniture for a radio and then the whole family would sit and listen to it uh i i don't think that uh the the heads of the family would allow the 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 youngsters to listen to the rolling stones or let's say in the radio uh so let's say the breakage with the past or let's say the the huge difference between those two generations it's argued that it was possible because they were able to listen to their own music independently <laughs> of the family radio. And uh, I mean, we, we could see a similar effect with internet, but uh, let's say already to, to a different level and with other implications. But yeah, I, if you want to know more about this, I, I really recommend this book. So um, the, there are many differences of programmable computing because we can speak about uh, let's say if we see just uh, uh, computing as information transformation then we could say that the earth uh moving around the sun is computing um let's say the calendar or time or, or whatever uh, but of course we can't program that um so let's speak only about programmable computing uh let's say information transformation but that we can uh affect so before and during the first war there were uh no and even after there were people um there were like two camps proposing us uh analog computing and digital computing and each had its advantages and disadvantages uh and at the end we ended up using digital computing uh because of several reasons 
well, an analog means that you don't have like uh, fixed values, but you have like a continuum. So it was like con continuum signals. And uh, well, actually for sound engineering, they're still used, but of course not in general uh, analog computers, but let's say uh, analog circuits and for other applications, they're still used. But uh, let's say digital computers, they were cheaper and also Turing, we'll see more about him. Um, Alan Turing showed that you could um, approximate any continuous function as much as you want with digital technology. So uh, it was price and also that with digital, you can do almost everything that you can do with, with analog computing. Um, and within digital computing, you, you have different types, most common is electronic computing uh, and this follows one for Neumann architecture we will see that in a little bit uh, and within that we have different types with one central processing unit several processors um, several cores um, and we also have clusters of computers uh, grids clouds and whatever comes next um, <laughs> So biological computing, uh, that includes D DNA computing and also slime mold computing. So uh, Odin writes that he can see so much of Adamaski works and indeed uh, Andy Adamaski has uh, worked some in biological and chemical, chemical computing. Well, he, uh, the field is called non-conventional computing. So. For example, with, with DNA computing, uh, some people managed to encode the traveling salesman problem, which is a classic problem in, in uh, combinatorics. Um, and let's say when, when the DNA falls in a certain way, then it kind of automatically solves the problem and then they can extract the solution. So in, in a way it can be faster than, uh, a traditional computer but of course it's, it's more like oh yeah we can do it with dna uh of course you cannot program it easily and it's expensive uh so it's like one example that uh, a proof of concept we've managed to, to prove uh, and even more with um with slime mold so uh, these uh, are unicellular organisms that given environmental conditions when they're too harsh they aggregate in colonies. Um, so th they have been studied for their collective behavior and also to try to understand the transition between unicellularity to multicellularity because these organisms kind of uh, go back and forth. And um, they, they managed to, to solve uh, some problems. So they've made some experiments. So for example, um, some Japanese researchers uh, put on a petri dish, uh, more or less a scaled map of the large cities in Tokyo, and they put food in each of the cities, and then the slime mold reproduced the rail network of Japan, uh, which would be analogous to, to finding the shortest paths or the optimal infrastructure for, for that. And, uh, Adamatsky and others did the same for, for other cities. Uh, General Juarez Martinez, I think, did the same for Mexico. And you, you get almost the same as, uh, as the highway network of Mexico. So they did that for England and many, many other countries. I mean, once you do it with a few countries, it's, it's not interesting anymore to do, to do other countries. So, um, the, when I was in, in uh, when I was an undergrad, the, there was uh, some push towards optical computing. So it, it seemed promising because um, <clears throat> if if you could uh, achieve computing with photons, then in principle you could uh, process information at the speed of light, and of course. You had fiber optics, which 
transmit information at the speed of light, but then the idea is, okay, how can we process information at the speed of light? So can we do something like a processor with fiber optics? And, and what they did already, uh, let's say the end of last century or even earlier, um, was uh, logic gates uh, for, for light beams. So depending on, let's say, whether there's or not uh, light, then they can do and or, or not. And from there, you can build everything. Uh, however, the problem with this technology was memory. So <laughs> how, how do you save a light beam? And then how do you extract it at the speed of light? So th that kind of became a problem. And uh, as far as I know, it's, it was abandoned. I mean, I haven't heard anything about it for 20 years. Uh, then th there's another toy example from uh, George Whiteside's uh, laboratory in, in Harvard, uh, where they use bubbles for, for computing. So they, they build like a, a little maze uh, that you can fill with water, and then they inject bubbles, and these bubbles represent bits. And again, you can build logic gates with these bubbles, and then you can do computing with bubbles. Uh, and um, uh, and it's easier to save <laughs> bubbles. I mean, the, the bubbles are persistent, so then uh, there's no memory problem. But of course, uh, let's say it's it's just a toy example because it's. Uh, it's not faster, nor cheaper, nor more effective uh, than, than traditional electronic computing. Uh, and in a similar way, uh, the chemical computing using reaction diffusion waves, it, it's something like that. You can also build a maze and then a reaction diffusion wave, you basically have a chemical reaction. And then let's say you, you can see a chemical wave that moves through the maze. And you can also build logic gates in that maze and then do computation, but of course it's very slow. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, like we saw the last class in the game of life that you can build a universal Turing machine, but it would be very cumbersome to program in the game of life. And um, quantum computing is becoming more and more popular as there are some recent advances and claims of finally some actual quantum computers, computers that have managed to, to perform some computations faster than, than digital computers. However, um, fr from what I understand, let's say these quantum computers are very far from being general purpose computers uh, because quantum computing has to be reversible and much of computation is not reversible in the sense that you lose information. Um, so, so let's say um, quantum computing has some advantages uh, over digital computing or let's say classical computing, but it won't replace, uh, let's say the electronic computers. The, they are for very specific applications so far. Uh, and if they manage to deliver, because let's say it, it has been advancing, but who knows, maybe it will reach some hurdle that they won't be able to, to overcome. So the phenomenon architecture, uh, which was used precisely in, in the ENIAC for the first time, um, it, it separates the central processing unit and, and the memory. Um, uh, actually, John von Norman, well, we will see more about him uh, next week, uh, but he, he was a polymath and he worked in the Manhattan Project in the atomic bomb and he developed game theory and cellular automata and also some of the first theories of self-reproducing machines. <clears throat> um, so yeah, he, he was a, uh, a genius. Uh, and actually, there are few computer scientists who are on on money on currency. So the, you know that important figures of a country usually end up in their money. So in Mexico, we have our uh, heroes from the independence, or Sor Juana, or Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, uh, and so on. So in in Hungary, they have uh, John Fonoman in his bills. 
And in the UK, Alan Turing would be the new 50 uh, pounds bills. So yeah, they're, they have recognized their contributions. Um, so basically you have inputs and outputs, and then the memory communicates with the central processing unit. And of course, this is very simplified version, but the main idea is that uh, you, you have a separation between where you store information and where you transform information. Uh, and this has many advantages because you can have a precise control of what's going on, and it also helps programming. Uh, so if you want to program a computer, it's useful to have separate what's changing and what's not changing. Uh, however, a more general uh, architecture of computing, it's simply you have inputs and outputs, and then the computer transforms those inputs and mixes them with some other information. Um, and then it gives outputs. And um, the, we could also introduce here a, a difference that, that has been proposed within artificial life, that I mean, artificial intelligence uh, one is its objectives is to, to use uh, technology to understand intelligence. So in a similar way, artificial life, uh, which was proposed in the late eighties as well. Um, well, we could define it as life as it could be, not life as it is, in the sense that if we build systems with the properties of living systems, then we can understand better biology. Um, so in artificial life, there's the division between soft a life, hard a life, and wet a life. Uh, so basically, you have it on software, on hardware, and on wetware, which is basically on on the petri dish. Uh, and we can say that we also have uh, general computing in these ways, meaning that we can program software and, and just look at computing at that level, uh, and it will be more theoretical or we can look at the hardware. Uh, and then there are different uh, things we could do with that. Uh, and also the, the wetware would be all these non-conventional computing uh, that let's say it's not, it's not so much to, to build more powerful computers, but to explore, let's say computing as it could be, or, or how can you program, um, let's say non-standard media. Um, encode and process information in, in, in substrates that uh, we usually don't think about as computers. Um, uh, Amari asked whether I can sh share this paper about analogies between growing slime molds and the growing of cities. Um, it, it, it was not so much the growing of cities, but the inf infrastructure that links cities, either rail or highway. Um, there, there are several. Um, if you search for Adamatsky, um, you, you'll find it. Um, okay. So what's a computable function? Um, along Turing, um, well, he's considered the father of computing precisely because of, of his 1936-37 papers. Um, so, so he was interested uh, in the Hilbert's decision problem. Well, he was a mathematician and he, he was studying mathematics in Cambridge. Um, and you could say that this was his master's thesis. So if you're studying your master's, don't feel pressure. You don't need to <laughs> found a whole new field defining something like, like Turing did, but yeah, okay, he managed to do that. Um, but it's interesting to go a bit into the history of what led to Turing defining the Turing machine, which was later, let's say, defining what's a computable function. Uh, so uh, Hilbert 
David Hilbert was one of the most renowned mathematicians of, of the early 20th century. Uh, so, for example, he uh, well, he was like the head honcho in the Göttingen School, which was like the capital of mathematics in Germany. Um, and um, actually, uh, he, he had some interactions with Einstein um, when when he wa uh, Einstein was pursuing general relativity, and, and Einstein couldn't get the math right. And Hilbert was like, oh, I think I got it already. And I was like, no, oh, no, I need to find it. And, and he was like two weeks without sleeping and he finally <laughs> got it. And then Hilbert also published it. So, so he got it in parallel, but he told, no, no, Einstein did it first. So he, he doesn't take credit for that. Uh, and he didn't need because he made many other contributions. Um, uh, and actually also, the well, just a side story about Einstein and, and relativity. Uh, Let's say when when he was um, trying to link space and time, let's say someone suggested, "Oh, you should check the mathematics of this guy." Um, uh, I forgot his name. <laughs> uh, begins with R. And anyone from the physicists help in the chat? <laughs> oh. um, um, so, so it mathematician who who made the uh, he, he, he was the one who who uh, developed the, the formalisms to, to work in more than three dimensions. Uh, Riemann, Riemann, yeah. So uh, check this mathematics by Riemann, uh, and let's say he, he had proposed well how, how to deal with four dimensions and more dimensions, uh, and then I sent took Riemann's mathematics and told, okay, this is space time and this describes the world. So the, and, and that was useful. But the interesting thing is, was that Riemann, why Riemann developed those mathematics? So he was an avid spiritist, uh, like uh, trying to speak with death and Ouija and everything. Uh, and he had the idea that the spirits inhabited in the fourth dimension. So he developed the mathematics in order to communicate with them or to understand how to communicate with them. And then that led to Einstein's relativity. So, well, it's small parentheses. So Hilbert proposed a program in 1900. Uh, no, no, sorry. In 1900, he presented like uh, different problems for, for the 20th century, but the, this program w was a bit later. Um, so uh, many, many people in those years, uh, also including Bertrand Russell, um, and Alfred Whitehead and, and many others, uh, many from the Vienna school, uh, the early Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein was also, uh, trying to, to move this forward. They, they had the idea, well, the, also before Einstein, like the turn of the 20th century, there was this idea that science is almost complete. So we just have to trim the last uh, unknowns and then we'll have uh, very nice, perfect theories. Um, so, uh, well, a proof of this was that in the Principia Mathematica of Russell and Whitehead, they kind of gather all the known mathematics and put, it, put them under logic. Uh, so the idea was, uh, of Hilbert was uh, he, he posed the problems that we should uh, prove that mathematics are complete co and consistent and decidable. And uh, not to go into the details of these concepts, uh, Gedel, Kurt Gödel, who later became a disciple of Einstein in Princeton, where von Neumann was also uh, active. Uh, so, so Gödel uh, and, and also Turing went to Princeton and spoke with with all of them. Uh, so um, Gödel proved that no formal system can be complete nor consistent. So that was like a deep blow for this whole Hilbert program for trying to prove, to prove that mathematics were complete. 
uh, and consistent, meaning that there will always be contradictions within a formal system. And he proved that. And um, but then there was the decision problem. Uh, and this can be briefly stated as uh, in a formal system, there are some statements that you can decide or not. And in order to address this issue, Turing defined the Turing machine. So um, to make a long story short, uh, he showed that uh, this decision problem doesn't have a solution with, with the Turing machine. Um, which was like a final blow for Hilbert's program. So basically between Gödel and Turing and later also Greg Chaitin uh, made some further proofs about the, the limits of formal systems. Um, and some people still don't accept those limits, but anyway, uh, the, yeah, the, the implications are still to be fully explored. Um, but let's say in order to, to make this proof, Turing defined a Turing machine and defined computing functions. And uh, the, the idea of Turing, which was not entirely new because for example, there were post machines uh, uh, that uh, were similar. Uh, so it has an infinite state. So of course it's a theoretical machine, not a physical machine. And it has a head that can read or write on, on this tape and then you have a state registry and a small memory in the in the head and then a transition function which would be the program that tells the head what to do depending on what it's reading on the table whether to write or to move uh, or to yeah what to do so uh, first of all Turing showed that you could compute any computable function and he defined computing actually he defined computable functions as a function that can be computed with the Turing machine. Um, and then he went on to show that uh, there are functions in particular, the halting function for which you don't have a general procedure for a universal Turing machine. Basically, you can't know whether a Turing machine will halt or not before it halts. Uh, and that means that let's say, universal Turing machines are non decidable So, um, he, he also defined what's not computable. So there are non-computable functions. Um, so the halting uh, function is not computable unless you have an Oracle. That's something that Turing proposed in, a, in another paper. Uh, so if basically, if you have enough information about Turing machine, then you can, uh, for that Turing machine, calculate its halting functions. So in other words, if you already explored a Turing machine and uh, a posteriori know that it will halt and how long it will halt, then you can have shortcuts to that particular function. And this is related also to the concept we mentioned last week of computational irreducibility. So if you have an Oracle, then you can reduce the computing, but then the Turing machine that includes the smaller Turing machine, uh, meaning that includes the Oracle, will have a new halting function. And then you cannot calculate the halting function unless you have another Oracle. But then for that machine that has that higher order Oracle, you will have a new halting function that you cannot compute without another Oracle and so on. Um, so one thing we should notice is that there is a difference between theoretical computing, which is precisely the one defined by Turing. So if a Turing machine can compute a function, then it's computable, if not, not. Uh, and then practical computing, it's like, okay, can a machine calculate something or not in finite time or not? It's because there are computable functions that you cannot compute in practice simply because you don't have infinite memory or infinite time. Uh, so yeah, it, it can, it, it, by practical means, it will it won't stop computing that function even when it's computable in theory. And on the other hand, if you have an oracle, then you can compute an uncomputable function. In practice, you can compute it a non-computable function, it's a theoretical non-computable function. So, yeah, we should have that uh, distinction in mind because sometimes people argue about computing. And if they don't specify that it's theoretical or practical computing, then it can lead to, to, to some confusion.
So uh, this leads us to, to stationarity. So uh, in optimization, we, we usually can represent a problem as a multidimensional space. So we have variables in our problem and then each variable can take different values. So here, uh, it, there are just two dimensions. So let's suppose we have a variable X and Y. It could be, I, I don't know, if we are building, um, I don't know, the wing of a plane, it could be the weight of the wing and the resistance of the wing. And of course, in real wings, you have many more variables, but let's just focus on this. So you also want to minimize cost and maximize resistance and so on. So if, if you, change one variable, then how will that affect another variable? And then let's say the solution, uh, let's say in the vertical axis, it could be how good is that solution? So uh, this, the red one could be very good and the blue one could be very bad. So optimization deals with how to find these solutions. Uh, and I mean, there's that that's a whole field. And, uh, So if your space is stationary, then you just use one of the existing algorithms and you find a solution, or you can use many algorithms in parallel and then one of them will find a very good solution. Uh, because of course, well, there, there's this no free launch theorems, which tells that for all possible spaces, uh, there won't be uh, best algorithm that will be good in all of them. And, I, and actually not only that, but that will be better than random in all search spaces. And this is a bit tricky because all possible search spaces are, uh, let's say, are a theoretical construct. And in practice, uh, we deal with just a small, a very small subset of all possible search spaces of which most of them are completely random. So that's why random search is, performs relatively well. So if, if there's no structure in your search space, then the algorithms will probably not perform very well. And, and it's better to do either a random search or an exhaustive search. And of course, the state spaces explode uh, very fast. So it's unfeasible to do ex exhaustive searches in, in most cases. So, um, yeah, I mean, in, in practice, yeah, there are algorithms that are better for most problems than others. So that's the ones we use. Um, however, uh, imagine that the problem is non-stationary because of complexity, as we mentioned last week. So if you have interactions that generate new information, um, and these interactions can be internal or external, or even the solution that you are applying to your problem can change the problem itself. So imagine now that this changes in time. So it could be like fluid or like a sheet, and then uh, this starts going down and then uh, you another better solution will start popping up somewhere else. So how do you adapt to those changes? Uh, and this is what we're interested in. So, in, in non-stationary spaces, so let's assume we have a function here, and then we have we can move within that function, so that would be change uh, of the solution, but not of the function. But then, if the function changes in time at at a different scale, say in time, uh, then how we move through that function will also change. So, uh, and then. If the way at which that function changes also changes in time, uh, then we need to also to adapt to how the change changes. <laughs> so uh, we need to consider multiple scales of change. Uh, and this is what, uh, why we need a course like this of adaptive computing. Because let's say if the problem you are trying to solve, if this space that you are exploring is non-stationary, um, if the problem you're trying to solve is changing, this means that the space is non-stationary, then your solution needs to be adaptive because otherwise it will simply be obsolete. Uh, and it has to adapt at all the scales at which the problem changes. So uh, just to conclude, uh, 
we can define very generally computing as information transformation. Um, traditional computing occurs over stationary spaces. So when you have a Turing machine, uh, let's say it reads over the tape, but then nothing comes and plays with what's going on in the tape. And the analogy of a non-stationary space uh, within a Turing machine, it would be like uh, a program is running and the head is computing. And then there are changes on the tape or there are changes in the program. So how can you build a, a program or a, a system that manages to find good solutions in spite of those changes that you cannot foresee and they are not included in the program. Uh, I mean, they're external to, to the Turing machine. Um, so yeah, if, if we are dealing with open problems, uh, the new interactions will generate new information and this will lead to, to unforeseeable changes. So we, we should better be prepared to face those unforeseen changes than just to stick with with traditional solutions. Moreover, because uh, we could argue that complexity is growing because our the number of our interactions are growing. Uh, we can see it with with the pandemic. Uh, so, in the Middle Ages, the bubonic plague took uh, several years to uh, ravage Europe and Africa and Asia. Uh, then a century ago, the so-called Spanish flu, which was actually not originated in Spain, but anyway, um, it took uh, a couple of years to go three times around the globe, uh, but the fastest uh, speed, let's say, to go from North America to Europe was about a week, a bit less, uh, like five days, you know, in steamboat. Uh, I mean, there was still no commercial aviation or, or it was just beginning. I mean, it didn't count for, for the propagation of, of, the, of the flu. Um, and, and it also created havoc uh, worldwide. Uh, and with the pandemics now, and also the, with SARS-1 and with the AH1N1, with air travel, you, you have an outbreak in one country and suddenly it's all over the world. Uh, and then there's a new variant and it's all over the world. Uh, I mean, so, so for example, the Omicron variant was detected in South Africa in November and they announced, hey, there's this new variant and it has these properties and we're worried and our cases are exploding. And then some countries thought, okay, we're shutting down flights from South Africa and their neighbors and so on. Uh, and then, uh, a few days later, Mexico detected the first Omicron case. And it was someone who had arrived from South Africa before South Africa announced that they had detected the variant. So let's say even when our technology is super advanced and we are able to detect these differences, I mean, compared to a hundred years ago where they didn't know that <laughs> the disease was caused by a virus. They, they didn't know what, what it was. I mean, they, they knew it was airborne, but the, the virus was isolated only in the 1930s. Uh, so of course we've, we've gone a long way uh, being able to sequence uh, the virus and to detect how it mutates, um, to measure how it mutates. But in, in spite of being that very fast, the, the moment it was detected, it was all over the world already. Uh, so, so yeah, these new interactions generate new information, which generate change, which limit predictability, which increase complexity, which demand adaptive computing. So uh, we will see more and more the need for adaptive solutions uh, in, in all disciplines because uh, the changes will keep on increasing. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that they will increase exponentially and then we'll have a singularity or hyperbolic or however. Uh, probably there will be a saturation point um, because of some limit, but uh, they won't get simpler, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, and we are having problem in managing current complexity.
Uh, so even if complexity was were not increasing, we would be in trouble because we don't have proper solutions to deal with with complexity. But since not only we have very high complexity, but it's increasing, uh, we can foresee that our solutions will become less and less effective for dealing with complex problems, unless we understand better and complexity and adaptation and self-organization and all the concepts that we'll see in this semester. So um, for the next classes, remember in, in classroom, well, on Thursday, we'll, we'll see a, a bit about deterministic chaos, which is related but different from complexity. Um, so for today, uh, remember, please upload three examples of complex systems and justify why why they are considered complex or what are you missing if you don't describe these as, as complex systems and let me let me go through to the browser because <coughs> it's a bit tricky so if you go to your browser, uh, I'm here logged in as, as a student. So on the left-hand side, uh, you see upcoming for Thursday uh, homework. And here uh, there are the instructions. And you, you need to do two things. So first, other creates, uh, well, sorry. Hmm. How, <laughs> how do you upload the homework? Well. Uh, well, you you have to to create your homework, but I think it's some somewhere here. Yeah. So then you write here, and I don't know, uh, the, I don't know the brain, whatever. Uh, sale market yeah I, I i'm sure you will be more creative with with your examples and yet just less than 500 words but apart from that uh go here and all the way to the bottom uh put your examples here and post them so that by thursday so th th this should be done today and then between tomorrow and the day after please go through some of the examples. I mean, there are way too many to, to read and probably the ones on top are have been read more than the ones in the bottom. So try to go to the ones on the bottom and comment on some of them. Unfortunately, I only noticed that here you cannot have like a uh, hierarchical discussion. So I cannot put a comment specifically to, to one of the examples that would be more useful. And also I cannot, uh, tag anyone so yeah I, I cannot tag anyone so uh yeah I, i'll try to find a better option for for next discussion but yeah the, those are two things so if you just did one of those please do the other so if you just uploaded your examples here as a comment please do them as well um here and if you just uploaded it as a google doc or, or whatever please copy paste them as, as a comment. Um, okay. So it's okay to upload a, a docs file, a do, Word document. Yeah, it's not a problem. Just copy paste into the chat. I think you did. Yeah. So, Okay, let me share again. So if you haven't done so, please download and install NetLogo. And homework for next week, it will be to read and uh, give your opinion about uh, an article that's kind of the one of the foundations of cybernetics. Uh, I'll, I'll put the details in the, in, in the classroom. Okay. Um, 
Are there any questions? Either related to to the course, the homeworks, or or the lecture today. Yes, Bruno. Um, you're not muted, but I can't hear you. Now you're muted. Uh, Fernando, uh, Bruno, if if you have problems with your mic, you can type in the in the chat. Um, Fernando Barrios, did you want to, to ask a question? Okay. So I, I trust that Bruno is typing. Yeah. Yeah, but more bibliography regarding the periods of the three historical revolutions. Uh, well, about the first two revolutions is like general history. And there's this book about big history. I, I forget who's the author, but that's like general universal history. It's, it's interesting. Um, the, there's a very good book uh, by James Gleick uh, called the, the Information, a History, a Theory, a Flood. Uh, let me put it here. Well, it even has a Wikipedia web page. That's, that's a very nice historic book because it starts, let's say, with information in our species, not with the electronic age, but way earlier. So he, he starts with uh, African drummers in the Gambia River that before European colonizers arrived uh, in those parts. Uh, so they, they, the villages had a communication system to, to yeah, with drums, uh, to send messages and information like, oh, the chief of this village uh, got married or um, giving news about uh, all sorts of things or, Hey, we have a party, come over. <laughs> I, I don't know what they were transmitting messages. Uh, but then that tradition or that knowledge was lost, I think in the 1950s or something like that. But the, it's interesting that they were encoding information unknowingly using the same principles that let's say we encode information in, in digital media. So, so for example, um, the, the way they would translate voice into drums was uh, almost automatic. So it, it was not like a Morse code that it's very abstract, but it, it was like, uh, I don't know, the, the bird is red, it would be like, bah, 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 bah. Uh, so, and it's just two notes, high and low. Uh, but so it, you could say it was binary <laughs> uh, information encoding, but then how they dealt with um, with messages that would have the same encoding. So uh, if if I just say pop pop pop, that could be many things, <laughs> and it's not understandable. But then the way they managed 
to uh, specify those things was including redundancy. So uh, instead of saying the moon, they would say, oh, the beautiful one, the, the beautiful silver one shining in the sky. Uh, and that would be like saying, pa, 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 pa. Uh, and that was unique. And like that, they were man they managed to have like the encoding into binary, like almost straight from the spoken languages, and and also back. Um, so, so so they would transmit it, like uh, the if you are Lord of the Rings fan, like the beacons of Gondor. That let's say there there are like these. Uh, fires going from peak to peak, but that's just one bit of information. And it was something like that along the river with drums, but from village to village, and then they would listen and then they would relay to the next village and uh, like that they would transmit all along the river. Uh, so yeah, that was an early uh, system of telecommunication. <clears throat> and, and another interesting thing is that when the first um, Atlantic telegraph wires were laid in the 1840s, uh, it so suddenly you were able to transmit information from Europe to the United States at the speed of light. Uh, well, not, not at the speed of light because let's say yeah, the, the timing between uh, signals of Morse code was, I don't know, a few words per minute. I, I don't know, like 30 words per minute maybe. Um, but, but yeah, let's say suddenly information uh, didn't take, I don't know, maybe the fastest ships were like five days from England to, to New York uh, in those years or even more. Um, and suddenly it was immediate information uh, propagation. Um, so, so that suddenly reduced uh, to, to a minimum, the, the information transfer delay. Um, and already in the newspapers of, of uh, in, in London, someone wrote that, hey, we, if we have this telegraph network, because of course the, the, there were lots of wires overland, this, uh, this connection between London and the United States was, um, it's a, a big breakthrough, but Europe was already uh, with, with a dense uh, network of, of telegraphs. And also United States had a, uh, a dense telegraph network and, and other parts uh, of, of the world, but of, of course not so much. Um, so the, the, in the newspapers in the 1840s, they, they, they were saying, already imagining that the in the future, there would be uh, like a, the, the telegraph network would be like a global net nervous system of, of the planet. Uh, and it's interesting that they made this analogy like decades before Ramon y Cajal described how neurons work. I mean, we didn't know anything about uh, neurophysiology, but we were already, oh yeah, it will be like almost like a global brain. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting to see how um, many things that we assume are relatively new. The ideas were already for a long time there, but yeah, the, the technology was uh, not there. So it was too, too early for their time, but um, yeah. Any, any other question? Uh, Amari asks that recently heard about the concept of liquid computer. Um, I, I haven't heard about liquid computer. Any, anyone has anyone heard about li liquid computer? Let me. Check the Oracle. Oh yeah. It's also the mask. <laughs> a, a brief history of liquid computers? Uh, I think it's similar to bubble, to bubbles. Um, 
yeah, he, he built some prototypes for liquid carrier signals, actuates mechanical computing devices and false chemical reactions. Sorry, yeah. again, with the, with the liquid computers, uh, apart that now we have like, um, how's it called? Uh, well, those electronics made of, made of uh, little water, but mo most of them in the past were calculations of integrals or differential equations or stuff like that. Yeah, but he, he uses fluid flows in jets. Fluid logic dates, fluid logic gates, also to find the shortest path in a maze. Yep. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's part of the special issue of liquid brain, solid brain. So uh, the, there's a student of ours, Jorquina Mendez, who. Uh, her, she's starting her PhD and she's also um, interested by this idea of liquid brains. So the, the idea is that usually brains are kind of solid, but then if you distribute information and it's not constrained, then you, you call that a liquid brain. Um, so, so she's interested about that. Um, yeah, the, the problem with this type of computing. So, so for example, uh, I, I, I didn't mention it, but perhaps you could co uh, consider it to, to fall within the, the DNA computing. Um, in, in the last, um, in, in the last uh, 20 years or so, th there's, there have been these iGEM competitions uh, that are about um, molecular programming. So th there is this idea that, uh, okay, we know what's the function of different genes. So then we can use them as libraries as with programming. And then you can grab these different genes in order to program uh, a bacterium to do some function that you want. And early on, they did some funny things like, uh, well, okay, let's grab these genes that give a glow to jellyfish and we'll put them into bacterium and then they will glow. Or uh, they, they made some things that smells like bananas or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, also bacteria that smell like bananas. Um, and uh, let's say that it was promising in the sense that, oh, we will be able to start aggregating these uh, genes to perform more and more complex things. The problem is that uh, it doesn't work like electronics where you can isolate the logic gates and then you can build more and more complex circuits and chips uh, and, and then you can uh, let's say, integrate them to perform more and more complex computations and network computers, and they will perform even more complex things. <clears throat> so in a molecular medium, let's say you have strands of DNA that, uh, let's say you, you say, hey, I want to, to program this. So you, uh, th there are some services that that's, you upload the sequence of DNA. And then in 48 hours, well, they sequence it, they fabricate it, and then they will send you in a little vial, I don't know, trillions of molecules with that sequence. And then you do whatever you want with that. Um, and, and it's not ex prohibitively expensive. I mean, let's say many, many laboratories can do that. So the idea is was that once we have these libraries and they're rich enough, then we'll be able to build more and more complex things. And then we'll be able to design uh, living organisms or non-living organisms or molecular machines that will deliver drugs to precise locations. And let's say we'll be able to, to do many things or, or some things that will brush your teeth uh, while you're sleeping. Uh, I mean, you can think of many applications, no? Uh, 
yeah, molecular machines that will do things that we normally uh, perform chirurgical operations to fix something like, I don't know, eyesight. Uh, so instead of eyesight, just put some eye drops with these machines and then the machines will fix your eyes or cure glaucoma or whatever. Um, the problem was that uh, it's almost impossible to, well, we haven't found a way, better, better said, we haven't found a way to uh, escalate to, uh, to, sorry, to scale the complexity of, of these um, solutions. Because you have a sequence, a DNA sequence, or it even doesn't have to be a DNA, just a molecule, could be a protein or, well, some, some function that you already identify. Uh, and then you want to combine it with this other function so that it does both things. But then when they you put them together, they either do something else or stop doing what they were doing because they're not isolated. They start combining and they mix and they stick to each other in ways that you didn't want and didn't expect because all the possible molecular interactions that uh, occur there are manifold. And in real living organisms, there are lots of mechanisms that prevent unwanted interactions to occur. Um, so it's, it's not trivial how to scale uh, these molecular functions. So I, I, I guess the same applies to, to many of these non-conventional computing uh, applications. So that's a challenge. Uh, and actually John Holland, who was, uh, He's credited with creation of genetic algorithms, and also has contributed well contributed a lot to to complex systems. His last book, or penultimate book, I, I forget, uh, it's a very short one called "Signals and Boundaries." Um, so it deals precisely with what we're speaking about, like uh, how different systems uh, transmit information as a signal. Uh, and how you need boundaries to prevent these signals from messing everything else that you're trying to deal with. Uh, and electronic circuits do that in a very controlled way, but then it's not adaptable. So most ways in which we do adaptive system is like on a software level. And if you want to build adaptivity at the hardware level, then we don't know how to do it because we lose the boundary aspect that we uh, need so much in, in electronic circuits. Okay, so um, have a great day and I'll see you on Thursday.